And now, I have the great pleasure to introduce today's featured speakers. And I'm especially excited because, like me, the hell from the South. And for those of you who like to subscribe to conspiracy theories, it's true, Southern women are taking over rally. <laughs> I am so excited about today's presentation because it touches on a topic that I am very passionate about. And it's one that I believe is critical to the future of land conservation, and that is community conservation. Andrew spoke eloquently about the importance of this issue last night in his talk. And I will tell you that one of the main reasons that I came to the Alliance is because I sincerely believe that if we do not succeed in connecting pe more people to the land, then we will not be successful in conserving and keeping conserved critical lands in the future. Robin Carlton is the Chief Executive Officer of the Lookout Mountain Conservancy in Chattanooga, Tennessee. She credits her mother with instilling in her a love of the outdoors, which became her safe place and foundation. She also loves the performing arts. In fact, she danced with the Southern Ballet Company and the Atlanta Ballet Company and performed at the eight, uh, 1972 Munich Olympics. She has also completed 18 marathons. Wow, Robin. <laughs> Although she has since traded her ballet and running shoes for hiking boots and waders. Before coming to the Conservancy, much of Robin's professional career was focused on mental and behavioral health care, concentrating on adolescents. I share all of this because Robin's boundless energy and her background inform her approach to conservation, one that embraces the role of the land in improving the lives of those in her community. And today, she brings with her two of her community members, Umar Muhammad, a uh, student at Howard School, and Zach Brown, assistant superintendent for Hamilton County and the school's former executive principal, both of whom will share their stories with me. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to my fellow Southerners, Robin, Zach, and Umar. Good morning, everyone. And I just want you to know that today's presentation is a little bit different than what I thought it was going to be 10 minutes ago. <laughs> As I looked down at my notes, I all of a sudden discovered that water has written all over my notes. <laughs> so this is to tell me, like many things along my journey in the land trust world, that my presentation to you in telling our story is not from my head and not from the pages, but from my heart. And I'm delighted to be here this morning to do that. <laughs> Have you ever had a dream that was so good that you never, ever wanted to wake up? Well, I have, and I'm living that dream. But let me tell you, <laughs> it has not been without a lot of sleepless nights and nightmares to get to where we are today. When I came into the land trust world, as you heard Wendy read off my background and share that with you, I was probably one of the least likely candidates to ever be standing before you today. But I tell you, I dedicated myself to learning the business of a land trust. And it was hard. This is a very hard business to understand. There's a lot of moving parts. However, during my journey of learning to be a land trust, there were three questions that continued to just come back to me that I could not resolve. The first question was, where are the people? We have this great trail system. We have a lot of public land, but there are no people. And so I began to wonder, do people actually figure into the equation of all the things that land trusts do? 
The second question I'm sure some of you are struggling with is, how do you make money? How do you keep your doors open? And then the third question was, should our land trust even keep our doors open? We are one of seven land trusts in Chattanooga. What purpose do we serve? Why should our doors remain open? As time goes on, I um, was taking my daughter to school one morning, and we heard over the radio that Lookout Mountain had had a landslide. And all the debris ended up on our trail. My daughter looked at me and she said, you know, Mom, you're not doing a very good job taking care of that mountain. <laughs> and the wisdom of an eight-year-old at the time was so brutally honest. <laughs> and you know what? She was right. She was absolutely right. Two years later, I get a phone call from the police chief of Lookout Mountain. And he says to me, Robin, you've got to come to your mount, to the trail at the top of the mountain and see what's on it. And I said, clue me in. What am I going to be looking for? And he said, you'll know. So I go up on the trail, and sure enough, as I'm walking down the trail, I lift my head up, and there it was. What I know today is a 362-ton boulder dislodged itself from the top of the bluff, traveled down the mountain about 200 yards, and embedded itself in our trail once again. <laughs> I call several of my board members and say to them, you've got to come up to the trail and look what I'm looking at. So they show up, and as they're overstudying the <laughs> the largeness, the hugeness of this boulder and trying to already get into how are we going to get it moved? It's obstructing the trail and we're going to blow it to pieces and then we'll sell the pieces. That's a part of our financial plan. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm over here thinking, we had a landslide. We didn't pay any attention to it. And now the mountain has dislodged this 362-ton boulder what is she going to do next if we don't pay attention? So I go back over to my board members, and I say to them, I've got it. Now, they turned around and looked at me like, what is she going to say next? And I told them that we had had this landslide, and we hadn't paid attention, and the mountain is speaking to us. And now we have this boulder. And if we don't pay attention, I'm really afraid of what the mountain's going to do next. And they looked at me and said, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I have very, I don't know where I got this from, but I looked at them and I said, we have to be bolder in everything we do from here on out. <laughs> That was a defining moment for me because I know all my board members were looking at me, nodding in agreement, reluctantly, but they were assessing my mental status. <laughs> Several months later, I was asked to go to LTA leadership training. The three questions that I had from almost day one of being in my position still haunted me. Where are the people? How do you make money? And should our doors stay open? I was sitting in a training that week at leadership, and I heard something that I had never heard in the five years before. And that was two words that absolutely made the most sense to me out of anything I had heard. It was the permission statement that I had been looking for. Judy Anderson was doing a presentation on ambassador landscape projects. 
The two words that she said was community engagement. I knew then that I was going to go find people because I had the permission to be able to do that. I never knew it was a part of the equation in the land trust world, but I wasn't going to ask anybody else if they heard the same thing I had. I was good to go. So I came back to Chattanooga with our inspired uh, presence of being bolder, and now with the permission to connect people. I didn't have a plan. Didn't know what was going to happen next or how I was even going to do that. But I knew that if the opportunity opened up, that I was going to walk through that door. Two weeks later, I get a phone call from the Tennessee American Water Company. And they said to me, Robin, we are going to award you the grant, but we need a favor. And so I asked them what the favor was, and they said, well, there's a local school nearby. And I said, I'm in. And they said, no, you need to just wait and let me tell you the whole story. So what they did not know was that for four years, I had been trying to get into the school system. And they had just opened that door that I could not open. So they proceeded to tell me that they were going to award a, scholar, a, a grant to the Howard School. And that the Howard School had never administered a grant and would I help them. When they said the Howard School, that was the best news I had ever gotten. Let me describe to you the Howard School. Chattanooga sits almost in a bowl with mountains. We call them mountains. Some of you Westerners will call them hills. I get that. <laughs> but they're our mountains. And they surround this city. And on the outskirts of this city is the Howard School. It is the poorest performing high school in Chattanooga. It is ground zero for everything that you would never want to be a part of. Gangs, gang wars, drugs, drug wars, everything. It exists there. I was so excited to be able to be a part of that community. Again, I didn't know how we were going to engage them until I went in and talked to the science teachers and told them about our grant and they told me about theirs and as, as we were discussing the how-tos, one of the science teachers looked at me and said, Robin, tell me how we're going to do this work. And I said, oh, we've got hand tools. I'll teach the kids how to use them. And he looked at me, and he leaned over the table, and he put his hand very close to my face. And he said, you need to stop. And I peeked around his head <laughs> and said, tell me about your kids, that, what I don't understand. And he looked at me and he said, Robin, you call them tools. Our kids will call them weapons. Well, you can imagine how I walked out of that room. I was madder than a hornet. And I was bound and determined that we were there to stay. And that this, this teacher had it all wrong. So we had the students come out to the property. And let me describe that first day for you. I am standing on the property, a staff of one. There's this big yellow school bus that drives up. And 50 students who I had never met before and four teachers get off that bus. I am scared, but what I now know is that they were more afraid of me. And the reason being is that historically, land has not been so kind to the African American community. And I was asking these kids to come to the woods. So we get up on the property, 
and we make a circle, and I look to the young man next to me, and I said, introduce me to the, man, to the young man next to you. And there was complete silence. I'm at a loss now, and so I just say to them, okay, introduce yourself. Tell me your name, what grade you're in, something about you. And out of all those kids, the only thing I ever got out of any of them was their first name. So I thought, well, this is going downhill quickly. I need to do something different. So we go down to the project area, and as we're making our way down the project area, two young men come up to me, and they say, Miss Robin, you seem like to be a nice lady, and we don't want you to think that we're being rude, but where we come from and where we live, we don't want anybody to know anything about us. So we get down to the project area, and these kids are out working on the property, and it's quiet. No one is talking to each other. About 45 minutes into pulling kudzu and English ivy and privet by hand, this young man comes up to me and he says, I don't really know what we're doing here, but it looks like to me the work might be a little bit easier if I go and get a big pair of scissors out of the bucket over there. And I said, please do that and come back to me. So I'm talking to this young man and I'm teaching him that he has a pair of loppers in his hand and how to use the loppers. And I take him down to a different area of the ravine and say, this is your area. And I need you to know that I trust that you're going to use these loppers just like I've told you. Can I trust you? And at that point in time, the young man held his head down and he looked up to me and he had the biggest tears in his eyes. And I said to him, what's going on? And he said, Ms. Robin, no one has ever said that they would trust me. The next thing I know, I look up and I've got 49 kids lined up to get their tools. I had the same conversation with every one of those young men and women. And I will tell you, five years since we've had this program going, there has never been an incident that any of those tools have ever been used as weapons. We work through the fall semester and it comes Christmas time. And I get a phone call from the teacher. And she says, Robin, I've got a group of young men and women that want to come and volunteer for you for three and a half weeks over Christmas. Can you accommodate that? Yes, I can accommodate that. <laughs> Absolutely. So I called one of my funders, and I, I had a grant from and I said, you know, I've got some kids from the Howard School that are coming out to work, and I sure would like to pay them. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I started something that you'll now soon understand where we're going with this. But I thought, you know what? If I've got grant money, they're out working. They don't want to be walking the streets. They have connected with this property. They have a sense of belonging. It's theirs. They need to be here. So the funding source said, oh, absolutely. So then we get off Christmas break, and students start coming back. Then it comes spring break. And I have the same situation. Kids who don't want to walk the streets, but want to come to a place where they belong, where they have purpose. And so I find other money to pay them. We get through the end of the school year, and I'm going, Oh, no. <laughs> what have I started? I'm looking at 12 weeks of summertime. So I very, get myself very busy in finding funds. And I will tell you that 
foundations at first, they liked the idea of keeping the kids off the streets. But it's so much more than that. And over the years, the interns and the students at Howard have shown that this is so much more. They find a sense of place. As a matter of fact, we have a part of our park that they are building, a 58-acre park. By hand, they are building. And a part of that park is called Howard Hill because it is theirs. They do belong. We today have 23 students as interns. When you start in our program in high school, if you choose to go to college, which many of our kids are first-time high school graduates, much less college graduates. We will have this next May our first three college graduates. <laughs> One of the things that I was very clear about in our transformation is that this program is not about us. It is not about Lookout Mountain Conservancy. It is about the community. And the minute that we ever let it be about us, then it becomes just a different project. We have put community engagement, community conservation. It's not a program for us. It's a way of life. We think of what we do as as natural as taking our next breath. I was so committed to it never being about Lookout Mount Conservancy that when we were doing our programs and still are doing our programs at Howard, I intentionally never met the principal because I did not want it to be about us. The students and the teachers were the ones to sell this program if it was to last. So I would like to introduce you now to a man that I avoided for a very, very long time. <laughs> I only know Zach Brown because he took an invitation that the interns extended to him to come and see some of the projects that they had been doing out on the property. As Zach and I were walking around and they were to showing him the trails and um, ditches and all the things that they had done that they were so incredibly proud of and should be, Zach would look at me and he'd say, my kids did this? And I would shake my head and say, yes. And then we'd go to a different project and he'd say, my kids did this? Yes, Zach, your kids did this. And finally, the third time he said that, I said, I can't stand it any longer, Zach. They're our kids. So at this point in time, <laughs> thank you. I would like to introduce you to Zach Brown, who is a gentle giant, who is a man with a vision, a man that loves kids, and the smartest thing I've ever done is put him on my board. Good morning. In 2014, 61.6%. In 2015, 68.6%. And this past year, 2016, 67.7%. Howard School has, has, has had a graduation rate of less than 70% over the last three years. While in contrast, that of the Lookout Mountain Conservancy interns has never fallen below 100%. Of 
As a high school principal, one of my main goals is to ensure that students graduate, as a school's success is often measured by its graduation rate. Typically, an inner city school is filled with students facing a variety of life challenges that no teenager should have to face. The students of the Howard School are no exception. Howard is a school full of students that have so much potential but need resources beyond what school can offer. In order for schools to be successful, it takes parents, guardians, faculty, staff, and the community at large must all work together toward a common goal. The Howard School has found an unlikely partner in the Lookout Mountain Conservancy. Imagine a high poverty school full of students with boundless potential and a parcel of land down the street that can provide them with the opportunity for success. I remember a story a couple years ago, one morning at school, I was called to the nurse's clinic. I get to the clinic, there's a young man, he's sitting on the bench, and clearly I can see that he's ill, he's not feeling great. The nurse is saying, Mr. Brown, hey, I've tried to call Sage's father, I'm unable to get a hold of him, uh, and I'm sitting there thinking, man, he really needs to go to the doctor. And so typically in an urban school, it's really difficult to try to find and get a hold of a parent during the school day. So I instantly look at Say and I said, Say, I said, who else can I call? Without hesitation, he said, call Miss Robin. I immediately called Miss Robin, explained the situation to her, but before I could even finish, she says, I'm on my way. <laughs> I told the nurse that Miss Robin's on her way and that she's gonna take care of Said. You see, Said was one of the Lookout Mountain's interns. And Ms. Robin treats her interns like her own kids. In education, we need great teachers and community partners in front of our students. But without a great relationship in place, students will not strive. That encounter confirmed to me as a school principal that the Lookout Mountain Conservancy intern program was a keeper. The program has three pillars that are perfectly aligned with the Howard School. Each and every one of the interns understands the pillars. You're a student first. You must be involved in your school somehow, athletics, fine arts, SGA. And then thirdly, you're an employee of the Lookout Mountain Conservancy. Well, this was tested one summer, a couple of summers ago. I was not really trying to test Miss Robin, but I just wanted to see exactly how this is gonna work out. When you think about student first, you've gotta be involved in school and then you're an employee of the Lookout Mountain Conservancy. Well, there was a young man who needed to go to summer school because he just kind of got behind during the school year. He needed to make up his Algebra II credit during the summer, and so summer school starts, but just like typical young men and young ladies, he didn't show up. So the teachers come to me and she sit, they showed me the, uh, the roster, and we were missing a few kids, and I was looking down the roster, and I noticed Lucas' name there. Hmm, well, Lucas is an intern. So immediately I went back to my office, picked up the phone. I called uh, Ms. Robin. I explained the situation, what was going on. And listen, this is the summer. So the interns do the bulk of their work during the summer. Called Ms. Robin, told her the situation. She says, okay. Okay, and so I hung up the phone. But you know, within 15 minutes, guess who was, in the, guess who was at school? <laughs> Lucas was at school and I saw him in the hallway and Ms. Robin told him that you go to school first and then you go to work. School is your first priority. Lookout Mountain Conservancy Intern Program is more about, is about more than helping kids get a job. It's about helping them reach their full potential. I often remind my faculty that our goal is to make our students, is to make sure our students graduate on time. And when they walk across the stage, that we want them to have the essential 21st century skills that's required for them to be successful. As a principal, I wanted our students to be able to do three things when they left Howard. I wanted them to be able to create things, collaborate, and to think critically. The intern program provides them with the opportunities to collaborate and to work through challenges they face while working on the trails. In addition to the intern program, Lookout Mountain Conservancy partners with Howard to provide field experience to our freshman environmental science classes. See, our goal at Howard is to engage all of our students in meaningful learning. So to this end, once a month, 
Students take a day away from school, we call it a work field trip, to volunteer and work with the LMC on their land. But more importantly, alongside their teachers, they get to go, they get to connect what they are learning in the environmental science class to the real world. This unlikely partnership makes it possible for many urban kids each and every year to experience the awe-inspiring magnificence of the natural world around them. As a principal of a high school, it's my responsibility to determine which of the many programs that are available to urban schools that will bring the greater value to our school, but more importantly to the student body. Without a doubt, the LMC intern program is a perfect fit for our school. Howard's interns are now role models and ambassadors of a school. They walk, talk, and perform higher than their peers. While Ms. Robin and LMC accept our kids just the way they are, they believe in striving to encourage and assist our young people to be the best they can be. So in conclusion, I often tell my students, I say, you know, people remember two things, how you start and how you finish. My students might have had an inauspicious start, but with the help of an unlikely partner, a land trust, their finish will be world class. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce to you a senior at the Howard School, Mr. Umar Muhammad. Good morning. My name is <laughs> My name is Umar Muhammad and I am an 18-year-old senior at the Howard School. I am also a four-year intern in the Lookout Mountain Conservancy program. The end of this summer, Ms. Robin asked me, would I miss the last game of my senior year, come completely out of my comfort zone, and stand before over 1,500 strangers and tell my life story? <laughs> All of my teammates and my peers just thought I was crazy to accept, but the important impact that this program has had on my life and so many others around me just had to be shared. <clears throat> when I wrote this, I was planning on standing, but I'm sitting, so <laughs> I sit before you today <laughs> as a six foot three, confident, popular student athlete with a 3.4 GPA. I I plan on going to college and majoring in biomechanical engineering, and I will, excuse me, I was one of the highest recruited players on my football team until I tore my ACL the third game of the season. And 21 days ago, I had reconstructive ACL surgery. Now, this clearly hasn't got me down, because I am determined to recover and come back 10 times harder than I was, and pursue my dream of playing college football. Now, I'm, I'm not standing before you to brag upon myself, but anyone who knew my past self or my past would be blown away by my confidence, my vision of a future, and hunger to succeed. Four years ago, it seemed as I was heading down the road of self-destruction. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about my past. I was born on the south side of Chicago, and I have little memory of this, but as many of you may know, that's probably a good thing. <laughs> my father, who was now an ex-Marine, had wanted my family to grow up in a different environment, and he had converted to Islam and wanted to further his education about Islam. At the age of three, we moved across the world to Syria, 
Now, many people thought traveling this young would be a great experience, but for my family, it was more hard than not. For the first time in my life, I had experienced racism, not because of religion nor skin color, but because we were mistaken as Somalian. At the age of five, we moved from Syria to Manchester, England. <laughs> my father had became a principal of a private Islamic school and England was a lot easier than Syria, but still had many difficulties. My father, who worked day and night, left us home to be homeschooled by my mother, who abused us, and he had no idea. My father was later arrested in England and lost his job. At the age of seven, we moved back to the States, and we moved back to Chicago. My father's health had declined, and he was unable to work. This caused us to have little food. Living circumstances were harsh, and for the first time, we lived in poverty. My father's health was steady going down, and my mother's temper was steady rising. In 2006, we moved from Chicago to a small town called Union City, Tennessee, due to a job opportunity my father had. But his health was still going down, so within months, he lost his job. Later that year, I watched my mother and father divorce. Along with my eight siblings, we all, my family split up. We moved to Nashville, Tennessee without a plan at all. And my father had moved to Chattanooga. My, me and my two older brothers, which is Say, who Mr. Brown talked about, is one of my older brothers, had instantly became the men of the house. We had to raise $900 a month. While other kids were in school, we were out selling incense, body oils, and soaps to produce money for bills and rent. My father had no idea what none of his children were, but one of his friends who recognized us had put us in touch with him while we were selling, and he came from Chattanooga to pick up my brother. He then found about the abuse of my mother, and he went to court and won custody of us, and this had started a new chapter in my life. My father, who had lived alone, had became very sick. He lived in the projects. And this was a challenge for me and my siblings trying to fit in for the first time as Muslim kids fitting in with non-Muslim kids. We were picked on daily by, we were being bullied by our last name, our clothes weren't, we didn't, my father didn't have the money to buy us the fancy clothes the other kids had. And my father who lived off a of disability, it was very hard. In 2011, for the first time, I had started public school, and this became one of the biggest challenges. I had no idea how to fit in. We were constantly bullied, called terrorists because of we were different. Our last name was different. Um, the so-called work we did at home school with my mother had put me so far behind my peers' education that I was, even though I tried hard as I could and I stayed to myself, I still had all else on my report card. Later that year, I had gotten into my first fight. And the good news is I won. The, <laughs> the bad news is this caught attention from gangs because of the school I was in. I started hanging with the wrong crowd and all of the wrong kids. Then I was arrested. This was putting stress on my father, so much stress on him, he threatened to send me to live back with my mother if I didn't straight up, straighten up by the end of my middle school summer. This was eighth grade. My brother said that summer had gotten a job working for Lookout Market Services. He came home so happy, and I seen later throughout the summer, he came home too tired to get in any trouble. He was, <laughs> he was wore out, and he was bringing my father money to help him pay with bills, and he kept my father happy, and I wanted nothing more to be like him. So one day he asked me would I come and volunteer at his job. And he offered me $50. I, without hesitation, said yes. Now, my first day volunteering, I was shorter than Miss Robin. I was, uh, <laughs> I was an eighth grader coming into the program with high school graduates with full beards. And I was so quiet. Uh, 
But I had stayed the entire week because though the work was hard, I fell in love with the feeling of being too tired to get in any trouble. And I just w wanted to have that feeling every day. Ms. Robin took notice of me coming every day and offered me, she said, would I like to come work for her at the conservancy? And I was so overwhelmed, I couldn't get my words out. And I told my brother to tell her yes. <laughs> <laughs> that summer, I had changed so much, and I saw the change in myself as everyone else did. We were working on the side of a mountain, moving large rocks off running trails to make them safer, digging ditches for runoff to protect hiking trails, we cleaned over 100 boulders and dozens of trees from kudzu evasion. Even though we were working in shaded areas, the temperature would still be 100 degrees with 100% humidity. We were constantly on the lookout for rattlesnakes, copperheads, swatting off mosquitoes. And with all of this, I still remember this as one of the best summers that I can remember. <laughs> I did things I never thought I would be able to do, like use a pickaxe to create a water trail to, or host an event with hundreds of people I did not know and just walk up to them, introduce myself, and tell them about plans for my future. I did not get in any trouble that summer, and I was able to bring my father home $50 a week to help him pay for bills. I, bought, I helped him with buying my sister's school clothes, and I bought myself the stuff that only I could wish I had, the other kids my age had. And this made me so happy. Also that summer, I grew six inches, so this helped my transition to high school. <laughs> I was the only freshman with a job coming into ninth grade, so I was no longer picked on about clothes or shoes. I was no longer trying to find friends because of the friends I had made in the program. And I was no longer trying to be like everyone else because my teachers viewed me as a leader and set standards so high for me all of my peers viewed me as a leader, and when, for the first time, people wanted to be like me. And that was the, one of the greatest feelings. I wore my Look at My Conservancy logo to school every day just, just to feel proud about myself. I adopted so many traits that summer, and from the program, I adopted the courage to stand before you today and tell my life story. And this is coming from possibly the shyest kid in school, the kid who was known as the poor Muslim kid. I will always say when people ask me, was I a Muslim, I would be embarrassed and I would say, well, my father is, so I wouldn't have to say yes. But then later, I realized I was only picked on because I was different. And I embraced being different. And this was probably one of the best things I ever done. Last year was possibly one of the hardest years of my life. We were living still off of my dad's disability, which had just became so small. He could not work, and me and my brother were the only ones working. And the summertime was going, it was school time, so we had to focus on school. Some nights I would come home from school and flick the light switch just for a sound, knowing the lights wouldn't come on. We had very little food, and the stress of my life went with me to school every day. I couldn't focus on my grades, because I was just in school thinking about how I could pull my family back together, and how I could help, and I couldn't focus on my work. A series of events forced me to move from my father's house and move back in with my mother, who had just recently moved to Chattanooga. Her living circumstances were worse than my father's. We had no electricity, no water, no food. It was hard. And living with her required changing schools, which also brought another challenge for me. I had to leave the Look at My Conservancy program, which was only through the Howard School, and I changed schools. I had to turn in my uniforms to Ms. Robin and all of my clothes, and everyone could tell something, all of my peers could tell something wasn't right about me. Ms. Robin could tell something wasn't right about me, and I think it was one of the hardest things for her, for me to turn my stuff back into her. I later started a job working fast food to help my mom with all of the bills. Every penny I made at work went towards her and went towards the bills. But then I was shocked. After, a week after my 18th birthday, I was put out of her house, and I had nowhere to go. This is when I realized Ms. Robin and the LMC interns 
had been my biggest support system, and they were my family. This was the first person I thought to call. <coughs> Ms. Robin had taught me more than just to work on the land and use tools. She had taught me to take control of my life and enabled me to make big decisions and make my second chances count. I called the lady who was a huge influence on me at the Howard School, and I asked her to come pick me up. She not only came and picked me up, but her and her family adopted me. I was given a bed, a room of my own, and food in my, in my stomach every night, and I think for the first time in years, I had slept in peace. Second chances are a huge part of what the Look at Market Service is all about. And the process to become an intern is a lot harder than people think. You must write an essay and tell why you should be in the program. You must have three teacher recommendations, volunteer with all of the interns at Ms. Robin for 20 hours, then you must interview with all of the current interns, then interview with Ms. Robin. <laughs> so, and then after this, we all come together and we make a list, three lists. One list is who needs the program the most, who do we work with the best, and who do we connect with the best. And new hires are all chosen from who needs the program the most. I needed the program the most. This past summer, two interns like me were given second chances. Both of them had joined gangs, and they told us this wasn't the life they wanted to live. They all came to us and told us that. And all of the interns got together, and we told Ms. Robin they needed the program. Ms. Robin allowed them to come back and, under circumstances, work again. And we realized we had the power to change people's lives, and this was so huge for us. We all need second chances. Mine came through a family willing to take me into their home and the Lookout Mountain Conservancy willing to take me back into the program. Without being given second chances, who knows where I'll be today? Possibly in a gang, homeless, shot probably because of the part of town I live in, a high school dropout, or work a minimum wage job that did not fit me. But I would not be here before you today to tell you how the program has changed my life so much or given me the confidence to stand before you and tell my life story and how it impacted me and given me a vision to succeed. Ms. Robin always says we found a way to use the land as a vehicle for success. And I feel as I am living proof of this success. Thank you. know how I'm supposed to follow that. <laughs> um, I will tell you, as Umar said, when he came into our program, he looked up to me. And now I look up to him in more ways than one. <laughs> in closing, I would like to thank the Land Trust Alliance for seeing something in this program that sometimes we don't see because we just do it, because it's natural for us. We have told our story on the largest stage in the Land Trust world, and we are grateful and humbled by that. I'm also humbled every day that I get to work with my interns. I am humbled by their true grit. That Alethea, Laquisha, Jawan, and Umar.
and the other 19 interns that are sitting in Chattanooga very angry with me right now. <laughs> we use the landscape to have people connect to the land. Land is the answer. Connecting people to the land is the answer. So my challenge to you, we are 1,200 plus land trust. What is and how does community conservation fit into the work that you're doing? Thank you very much.